Okay, so we can start uh, quarter past uh, five. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Raphael Michel uh, automatic screenshots of your web app with Selenium and PyTest. Is he here? Yep. Yeah. And the next one will be Mikhail Penkov. Is around? Okay, we'll just wait for your turn. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to my short lightning talk about automatic screenshotting. Why am I doing this? I develop a web application and for this web application I have documentation and you should have documentation too. And in this documentation I have screenshots of my web application and I have the problem that it's very tedious to create those screenshots because I have to create test data and log into you and have the browser in the correct size and take the screenshot. And once I'm done and change a feature in the web application or change the design, all of the screenshots are outdated and I can start over. So I want to do this automatically. And the ingredients that I use for this are the following. First, Selenium. You might know Selenium from testing. Selenium is a way to instrument your browser to do things. You can just say Selenium here, browser, click there, click on this object, find this object, scroll there. And I run Selenium to instrument the newly released Chrome headless, which is Chrome with all its features, but running without you needing a screen for it. And I want to define the screenshots that I want to make um, very conveniently, so I use PyTest. You all know PyTest probably. It's a nice framework for testing in Python. Um, and it provides me with a very simple way to write tests, to run tests, and to use fixtures. I don't have the time to explain PyTest fixtures to you, but you should look into them. They provide a way to declare dependencies on your tests or code that needs to be run before your test can be run. There's also PyTest Django, which I can recommend, um, in which also bridges Django's live server test case to PyTest. Live server test case defines a test case that expects your Django application to run on a live web server. So we can access it from the browser. So what we do is we change some settings of PyTest to rename some things because we're not testing here, we're taking shots of scenes and um, luckily we can configure a PyTest to our alternate language and we define fixtures for our test data that we want to be shown in the screenshots, for example, a user fixture that creates a user in our database. And we define a fixture that creates a Selenium client that logs in our user to our backend and then waits a bit and, and does all those prepare preparations. And we also have a fixture that sets the options for our Chrome instrumentation um, because we want Chrome to be headless and of a specific window size. Now we can start making screenshots and defining a screenshot in code is now really beautiful. We define it just like a pi.test test. We just define the fixtures that say, um, the, that specify the requirements that um, this screenshot has. For example, we need to have an organizer or user object or any other fixture. We need to, to have a live server and we have to need, to need to have a test client that's already logged in. And now we just, we just instrument the browser to go to this page, maybe fill out a form or something, and then take a screenshot with this file name. And to run it, we just run pi.test and the folder which, with all our scenes. And with this single command, we can redo all the screenshots of our application that we defined and can embed that into our application. So it's really simple. It's very easy to set up and it saves a lot of time once you define your screenshots. If you want to look at this, this is the GitHub repository with the, the code um, making the screenshots for the pretext documentation. If you want to talk to me about this slide will be gone in a couple of seconds, but this is, this is my contact info. I will also put the slides online somewhere um, where you could find them. I will probably tweet a link to them. So, and since I'm only four minutes into this, I want to um, use the remaining minute as a, an invitation to DjangoCon Europe, which will be happening in Heidelberg, pretty close to here next year. Uh, from May 23rd to 27th, we will have three days of talks and two days of sprints, so 
similar format to here. It will be all around Django, people from all over the world. It's a great conference. You should all come. You should all convince your employers to sponsor this conference right now. And um, you should follow us on Twitter, sign up for the newsletter, and uh, stick around and, um, and follow the news. We will probably have tickets for the conference starting in December, and we would love if many of you would come there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raphael. So for the newcomers, it was quite easy uh, how to do a lightning talk. The new sheet of paper is uh, at the conference desk, so you can sign up for tomorrow. Uh, now comes uh, Michael talking about uh, counterintuitive optimizations. And do we have uh, Anand here? Will be the next one. And may I ask the people standing over there, there are still a few uh, free places here so you can take your seat. Thank you. I need a slightly longer key. I'll just do this. You can. Uh, okay. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Michael Penkov and I'm going to talk about uh, some counterintuitive optimizations that I've had to make uh, recently. Uh, so a little bit about me, um, I'm a Python developer slash uh, data scientist, I'm based in Sapporo, Japan. Uh, this is my first time talking about PyCon, so please be nice. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Japan is the land of volcanoes, earthquakes and Godzilla. Anyone here from Japan? It's really surprising. Uh, so you can see I'm up there in the north. That's where I live. So what do I do? I uh, gather the main data from open sources. So for example, here is uh, some information that we we'll typically gather. So for a sample domain, I'd know how many links they have on their page, what tools they use, who issues the SSL cert, and also what kind of web server they have, for example. I typically store this in uh, MongoDB using uh, the class there. It's a simple record with a field for each uh, member of the JSON. I use libraries like PyMongo and Mongo Engine to interact with this database. So in terms of scale, I typically handle around uh, 500 million such domains. For each domain, we collect about 100 attributes, and this adds up to about 100 gigabytes of data, give or take. So. One of the problems that we've recently had to deal with and which inspired this talk is, given a list of domains, uh, how do we find out domains we haven't seen yet? So the Pythonic way to do this, it's quite trivial and it's very idi idiomatic code, is you step through the database and you see what's, what you have and what you don't and you keep the stuff that you don't, uh, you don't have. This is very Pythonic but it's also extremely slow and if you're doing it on hundreds of millions of records, you take a lot of coffee breaks and it's not a lot of fun. So a painfully faster way to do this is just to use something like uh, Mongo export and then some uh, Linux command line tools like com. So Mongo export gives you the stuff in a database, com in this example gives you things that are not part of the second file and that solves your problem in a much uh, shorter time. But the down, uh, downside is everything needs to be sorted and it's kind of ugly. So this also feels wrong because uh, you've taken all this time to index your data in a database and why do you have to do file I/O and sort? And the answer is, well, because it's faster and uh, more convenient. And the question that comes to mind often is, why is that so? And it's because database queries are expensive and existing tools out there have already been optimized uh, many, many times. So you can either optimize your own tools or avoid re re So just a brief example of how I did this. Uh, to mimic this bash command, you could use a uh, standard library subprocess uh, like this. It's a little bit involved, but if you use another library called uh, Plumboom, then it's uh, very, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a very useful library for uh, writing uh, pipelines that do uh, things very similar to what you do in Bash. So of course, it's a trade-off because how much work do you want to do in Python and how much work do you want to do in other tools? And if you involve other tools, you make things more difficult for 
uh, testing your uh, library or application and you make it less clear because you couple your implementation to those tools and whoever is going to be reading your source needs to be familiar with those tools. So it's a trade-off. You get speed against scalability and readability. And uh, well, how do you solve this? Uh, you just need to be wise about it and uh, yeah, use your judgment. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Aman's talk won't be so lightning fast. Uh, he needs uh, some more time, so I'm going to ask uh, Reinout uh, Fanres. Uh, here. Uh, easy releases with test uh, releases. It works. Always a surprise when it works uh, the first time. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about a little tool called uh, Zest Releaser. It exists for 10 years or so uh, now. Um, it's to make, the, its goal is to make uh, software releases with mostly Python uh, easier because there are quite a lot of steps you have to do when you make a release. You have a version number with, if you, yeah, mostly a dot .dev zero or something, a marker behind it. You have to remove the marker. Uh, you have to record the date and the change log. Then uh, actually make a tag. Uh, don't forget to push everything. Uh, update the version number. Add a new line in the change log. And oh yeah, uh, oh, you shouldn't forget to upload it to uh, the tag. Uh, as a release to PyPI and not your current uh, master after you've done all this. So, <clears throat> okay. Uh, a pro common problem is laziness. Uh, you can see it in two ways. Well, on the one hand, you have colleagues who skip half the steps or don't uh, update the version number or forget something or... On the other hand, if you make a tool that does the right thing and there's just one command and just a couple of enters and you've, uh, everything is handled, then uh, your lazy colleagues are your best friends because they will use your tool instead of doing everything half-half by hand. So what does this release do? Uh, it handles a version number, which is mostly in your setup.py in two or three different ways. Uh, or you can have a version.txt if you don't have a setup.py or version.rst or capital letters, etc. Uh, it assumes that you have a change log if you have one uh, in uh, restructured text format. So it looks like this. Uh, it will, when you make a release, it will put the date of the release between parentheses and an unreleased for uh, the new heading. Um, yeah, if the new heading misses, and the first one who has to uh, update something in the change log, and there's no heading has to edit, ah, that's a lot of work. If it's already there, it's super easy to just do the work. Uh, it supports Git, Mercurial, Bazaar, SVN. I think that's the whole list. Uh, it can upload to PyPI. If your project is registered there, it will even offer, if it's not registered, it will detect it and ask, do you want to register it? But uh, there's a plugin mechanism uh, which people can use for uh, custom documentation, uh, extra steps, uploading to, and uh, not to PyPI, but to something company internal, updating a version number in a weird uh, a place. There have been all sorts of people making their own kind of plugins, so it can fit in quite nicely with your own uh, company's uh, standards. So uh, try it out, just pip install, and you can find it if you Google for it. Thank you. So thank you, Renaud. Uh, is Amand Lightning here? Okay. And then we have Python Software Verband. Okay.
Hello. Good evening. <coughs> I'm going to talk about uh, deploying ML apps in minutes. So, <coughs> so one thing uh, data scientists usually face is uh, uh, once the machine learning model is built, taking it to production is often hard, uh, and also it's not really standardized. So, <coughs> what I'm going to show is uh, uh, some of the tools and techniques that you can use to deploy ML applications uh, uh, pretty quickly. So uh, let me give a brief about uh, what I work. So I'm, uh, I'm a co-founder of a startup called Auto Data. We're trying to build a Heroku-like platform for data science. Also do advanced programming courses at People Academy. <coughs> uh, so uh, the first problem is uh, when you deploy a machine learning application, you usually want to deploy it as an uh, API so that uh, other applications can use. So the problem starts were, uh, with uh, you want to uh, expose as an API. So the problem is now, how do you expose an API? You have to write a web app uh, and then worry about data validation and other things. <clears throat> and also, uh, once the API is ready, then you have to make sure that you have a client library that you need to write again to use it there. So it's kind of, there are a um, uh, lot of problems, lo really a lot of overheads in actually doing this. <clears throat> so uh, we have written a tool called Firefly. It's an open source tool uh, for making Python, deploying functions easy. So all you have to do is write a function. Let's say think function square. It takes a number and computes its square. <coughs> and then uh, on the expose an API, say Firefly square or square, and there you go, you have an API to use. Now to use it, you create a client, and then say client dot square, give n equals two, and you have, it calls it via the API. Behind the scenes, it actually is a RESTful API. It calls it, uh, uh, it sends a post request and get the response back. <clears throat> while uh, let's look at a more practical example. You want to deploy a machine learning model, so you have a, a predict function that takes a model and then calls a predict, uh, <clears throat> and then you run an API uh, using Firefly and then use the client to uh, predict that. While <clears throat> it's open source, you can use it to pip install. But okay, it's all fine, but it runs it on my local machine, but how do you deploy it as a cloud? <clears throat> so we have a hero like pass platform for you to use. Uh, at aurorodata.com. So the way it works is you write a, a small uh, ML file saying that what's the project name, uh, what's the runtime that kind of specifies what's your base environment, and then say what services that you want. So the platform allows you to specify which functions are going to expose as APIs. So you say that I want to predict or predict as a default uh, service, and there's other create great service. You want to run two of the services as part of the project and say Aurora deploy. So what it does is, it deploys all of it behind scenes. It uh, <coughs> builds a Docker image. It starts with the base image, installs all the dependencies that you specified uh, in your requirements.txt file, <coughs> and then starts all the services and then gives you endpoints for you to use them. That's all you need to do. Well, you can also uh, run uh, other programs. So you can say, I want to run uh, my train program on a 60 core, a 60 core uh, machine with one terabyte RAM. You just have to specify the instance size, and that starts it there. Or you want to run it on a GPU, just give an uh, uh, instance type that you want, it starts it in the cloud automatically. Or you want to run a notebook, say minus run notebook, and then uh, it gives a URL for you to write, go there and then use it right away. <coughs> well, uh, this is a PLAS platform. It's not something that you can run on your own server. Uh, <coughs> well, so that's, you can say, I want to run it on my own server, how do you do that? Well, we have a light version of the platform, which is an open source thing that you can deploy it, use it on your own server. Uh, this is the URL for that. The way it works is it's pretty close, so it uh, mimics the API of the platform. So you write a roro light.ml. Uh, instead of saying that what project and other things, you say what's a host name. So you have to log into the server. Uh, and then what's username to log in and specify the services. Here you need to also specify the port number because uh, it has run on a port. So you specify an API and a web app, both of them are on to run. So the API is an ML API, and then there's a web app to expose that as a service, as an uh, uh, application. So you say uh, Roro deploy, that deploys it, and then it then gives you that it has two of these services running, API at port 8080, and then web app at 8088. API at 8000, and then web app at 8080. You can look at logs, you can say Roro light logs and API, it prints all the logs of that uh, thing. <clears throat> the summary is like you have three tools that I've mentioned here, Firefly, which is an open source tool to deploy function as a service. Uh, the Roro platform, it's a fast platform that you can use. Uh, <coughs> And Roro Lite is light version of the platform. It's again open source that you can use it on server. And these are the resources, the Firefly, aurora.com, and uh, uh, the URL for that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Hello.
Oh, thank you very much. Are you enjoying PyCon until now, so far? So now we will hear something from Python Software Verband Community for the Program 2018. And then uh, Jens Dietrich, is he around? Okay. I have here one last free spot for a lightning talk. If you sign up now, you will get a, st get a sticker. Two stickers. Three. You get no stickers, please? Nobody? So does everyone know how lightning talks work? Everyone. No? Um, lightning talks uh, are a shorter form of a talk. So you have like five minutes uh, to stand up here. You can use uh, slides, uh, connect your uh, laptop, uh, or you do it also without slides. Uh, you will have uh, five minutes uh, maximum. If you want to present uh, a conference, uh, you have like uh, only two minutes, because that's more than enough. Um, no recruiting, please. Uh, no handstands here. Um, and uh, we will. Have ich gesagt? Hast dich zugehört? Um, and if uh, so, we can test it uh, how we measure the time. Uh, if uh, someone is uh, over his time, uh, over his uh, five minutes, I will raise one hand and you are going to clap like this. Can we try it out? Okay. And when I raise both hands, it's applause. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so we can start uh, quarter past uh, five. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Rafael Michel uh, automatic screenshots of your web app with Selenium and PyTest. Is he here? Yep. Yeah. And the next one will be Mikhail Penkov. Is he around? OK, you just wait for your turn. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to my short lightning talk about automatic screenshotting. Why am I doing this? I develop a web application and for this web application I have documentation and you should have documentation too. And in this documentation I have screenshots of my web application and I have the problem that it's very tedious to create those screenshots because I have to create test data and log into you and have the browser and the correct size and take the screenshot. And once I'm done and change a feature in the web application or change the design, all of the screenshots are outdated and I can start over. So I want to do this automatically. And the ingredients that I use for this are the following. First, Selenium. You might know Selenium from testing. Selenium is a way to instrument your browser to do things. You can just say, Selenium here, browser, click there, click on this object, find this object, scroll there. And I run Selenium to instrument the newly released Chrome headless, which is Chrome with all its features, but running without you needing a screen for it. 
And I want to you define the screenshots that I want to make um, very conveniently, so I use PyTest. You all know PyTest probably. It's a nice framework for testing in Python. Um, and it provides me with a very simple way to write tests, to run tests, and to use fixtures. I don't have the time to explain PyTest fixtures to you, but you should look into them. They provide a way to declare dependencies on your tests or code that needs to be run before your test can be run. There's also PyTest Django, which I can recommend, um, in which also bridges Django's live server test case to PyTest. Live server test case defines a test case that expects your Django application to run on a live web server so we can access it from the browser. So what we do is we change some settings of PyTest to rename some things because we're not testing here, we're taking shots of scenes and um, luckily we can configure a PyTest to our alternate language and we define fixtures for our test data that we want to be shown in the screenshots, for example, a user fixture that creates a user in our database. And we define a fixture that creates a Selenium client that logs in our user to our backend and then waits a bit and, and does all those prepare preparations. And we also have a fixture that sets the options for our Chrome instrumentation um, because we want Chrome to be headless and of a specific window size. Now we can start making screenshots and defining a screenshot in code is now really beautiful. We define it just like a pi.test test. We just define the fixtures that say, um, the, that specify the requirements that um, this screenshot has. For example, we need to have an organizer or user object or any other fixture. We need to, to have a live server and we have to need, to need to have a test client that's already logged in and now we just we just instrument the browser to go to this page, maybe fill out a form or something, and then take a screenshot with this file name. And to run it, we just run pi.test and the folder which, with all our scenes, and with this single command, we can redo all the screenshots of our application that we defined and can embed that into our application. So it's really simple, it's very easy to set up and it saves a lot of time once you define your screenshots. If you want to look, at this, this is the GitHub repository with the, the code um, making the screenshots for the pretext documentation. If you want to talk to me about this slide, will be gone in a couple of seconds. But this is this is my contact info. I will also put the slides online somewhere um, where you could find them. I will probably tweet a link to them. So, and since I'm only four minutes into this, I want to um, use the remaining minute as. A an invitation to DjangoCon Europe, which will be happening in Heidelberg, pretty close to here next year. Uh, from May 23rd to 27th, we will have three days of talks and two days of sprints, so similar format to here. It will be all around Django, people from all over the world. It's a great conference. You should all come. You should all convince your employers to sponsor this conference right now. And um, you should follow us on Twitter, sign up for the newsletter and uh, stick around. And, um, and follow the news. We will probably have tickets for the conference starting in December, and we would love if many of you would come there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raphael. So for the newcomers, it was quite easy uh, how to do a lightning talk. The new sheet of paper is uh, at the conference desk, so you can sign up for tomorrow. Uh, now comes uh, Michael talking about uh, counterintuitive optimizations. And do we have uh, Anand here? Will be the next one. And may I ask the people standing over there, there are still a few uh, free places here so you can take your seat. Thank you. I need a slightly longer. I'll just do this. Uh, okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Penkov, and I'm going to talk about uh, some counterintuitive optimizations that I've had to make uh, recently. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a Python developer slash uh, data scientist. I'm based in Sapporo, Japan. Uh, this is my first time talking at PyCon, so please be nice. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Japan is the land of volcanoes, earthquakes, and Godzilla. 
Anyone here from Japan? It's really surprising. Uh, so you can see I'm up there in the north. That's where I live. So what do I do? I uh, gather the main data from open sources. So for example, here is uh, some information that we we'll typically gather. So for a sample domain, I'd know how many links they have on their page, what tools they use, who issues the SSL cert, and also what kind of web server they have, for example. I typically store this in uh, MongoDB using uh, the class there. It's a simple record with a field for each uh, member of the JSON. I use libraries like PyMongo and Mongo Engine to interact with this database. So in terms of scale, I typically handle around uh, 500 million such domains. For each domain, we collect about 100 attributes, and this adds up to about 100 gigabytes of data, give or take. So one of the problems that we've recently had to deal with and which inspired this talk is given a list of domains, uh, how do we find out domains we haven't seen yet? So the Pythonic way to do this, it's quite trivial and it's very idi idiomatic code, is you step through the database and you see what's, what you have and what you don't and you keep the stuff that you don't, uh, you don't have. This is very Pythonic but it's also extremely slow and if you're doing it on hundreds of millions of records, you take a lot of coffee breaks and it's not a lot of fun. So a painfully faster way to do this is just to use something like uh, Mongo export and then some uh, Linux command line tools like com. So Mongo export gives you the stuff in a database. Com in this example gives you things that are not part of the second file and that solves your problem in a much uh, shorter time. But the down, uh, downside is everything needs to be sorted and it's kind of ugly. So this also feels wrong because uh, you've taken all this time to index your data in a database and why do you have to do file I/O and sort? And the answer is, well, because it's faster and uh, more convenient. And the question that comes to mind often is, why is that so? And it's because database queries are expensive and existing tools out there have already been optimized uh, many, many times. So you can either optimize your own tools or avoid re re All right, um, to everybody who doesn't speak German, sorry, this is a kind of German topic anyway, so I'm going to switch over to German. Um, oh. Also, um, ich bin Toini, um, ich gehöre mit in den Vorstand vom Python Software Verband. Um, wir sind uh, sozusagen die deutschsprachige PSF, wenn man es mal irgendwie uh, so formulieren möchte. Um, Python 2017, um, ich glaube, uns geht so gut wie... Uh, noch nie. Ähm, alle Rankings, die ich so jetzt äh, im Jahresrückblick angeguckt habe, positionieren Python irgendwo unter den Top 5 oder auf dem allerersten Platz. Ähm, insofern dürfen wir uns alle einmal selber auf die Schulter klopfen. Ähm, tatsächlich wirft das eine Frage auf für uns, nämlich ähm, was bedeutet es jetzt eigentlich, Python noch zu fördern und voranzubringen. Ähm, für uns als Verband, ähm, und das Ganze ist jetzt ein Preview, ähm, heißt das, wir müssen jetzt mal ein bisschen überlegen, was sind eigentlich unsere satzungsgemäßen Aufgaben von wie fördert man Python? Und die Gießkanne im Sinne von allen Leuten über Python was zu erzählen, äh, halten wir gar nicht mehr so für äh, relevant und wichtig, sondern was wir gerne machen möchten, ist, wir möchten in einem mehrschichtigen Verfahren ähm, unterschiedliche Communities ansprechen, mehr Leute miteinander vernetzen aus der Open-Source-Welt, aus unterschiedlichen äh, Hintergründen, ob äh, Schüler, Studenten, äh, Senioren, Migranten, Frauen, <lacht> Leute, die Machine Learning machen, Leute, die Grafik machen, Leute, die Kunst machen, Leute, die äh, irgendwelche Dinge betreiben. Ähm, wir wollen das dezentraler machen, wir wollen da mehr Diversität fordern, wir wollen mehr experimentieren. Das machen wir auf drei Ebenen ab nächstem Jahr. Das eine ist, wir schreiben eine Kopfprämie aus sozusagen und sagen, wenn ihr irgendwas vorhabt und andere Leute mit Python in Kontakt bringen möchtet und eine kleine Veranstaltung selber machen wollt, dann geben wir euch für die Veranstaltung pro Person, die daran teilnimmt, 20 Euro bis maximal 400 Euro, also 20 Personen. Oder wenn ihr eine Konferenz organisiert, die irgendeine an einer Stelle was mit Python zu tun hat. Und da werden wir alle noch ein bisschen experimentieren müssen, wann ist es genug Python, also reicht es, wenn, der, wenn das Videotranscoding davon in Python stattfindet, vermutlich nicht. Wäre schön, wenn es inhaltlich was mit Python zu tun hat. Dann gibt es ab 50 Personen 
Projekten einmalig 1000 Euro. Und wenn ihr Open Source Entwicklungen mit Python macht, die auch einen expliziten Python Bezug noch haben, auch das werden wir noch herausfinden müssen, wo sind da welche Grenzen, gibt es bis zu 800 Euro pro Ereignis. Wichtig ist uns, wir wollen nachher nicht in einer Belegzettelei mit, gib mir mal bitte noch eine Taxiquittung und dies und jenes und argumentiert das geben, sondern an der Stelle wollen wir euch möglichst viel Freiheit geben, selber herauszufinden, wo macht es Sinn, eigentlich für euch Geld in die Hand zu nehmen, um etwas voranzutreiben, um mit Leuten in Kontakt zu kommen, ob ihr einen Raum mieten wollt, ob ihr Pizza braucht, ob ihr mal einem Entwickler Fahrtkosten bezahlen wollt, um euch ein Wochenende irgendwo zusammenzusetzen und was zu hacken. Deswegen formlos erstmal per E-Mail. Der Vorstand entscheidet es. Wir machen einen Sponsoring-Vertrag rein formell und machen ganz, ganz wenig Papierkram nur. Davon gibt es danach zum einen, wir kündigen das auf der Homepage an und dokumentieren das. Wir hätten gern von euch ein Foto danach, wir hätten gerne eine Teilnehmerliste, damit wir wissen, okay, da waren wirklich 20 Leute da und wir hätten gerne zwei bis drei Absätze, Bericht darüber, was jetzt eigentlich dabei rausgekommen ist. Langfristig will ich das ausbauen, wollen wir das ausbauen mit Quervernetzung zu anderen Angeboten. Die EuroPython Society hat hier ja auch Geld mit dazu gegeben, zum Beispiel für das Financial Aid Programm. Dann gibt es noch solche Sachen wie den Prototype Fund und die PSF, die auch Geld in die Community tragen. Und das Programm muss dann natürlich auch noch evaluiert werden. Wenn ihr Projektideen habt für solche Sachen, wo ihr sagt, ich wollte immer schon mal schon was machen, ich wollte mal was mit Schülern machen und denen ein paar Raspberries geben oder solche Sachen, dann meldet euch bei uns. Auch umgekehrt, werdet Mitglied, dann wird der Fördertopf größer und wir können das mehr in die Community reintragen. Wir sind noch im Aufbau davon. Das muss auch noch formal beschlossen werden. Morgen ist die Mitgliederversammlung. Guter Zeitpunkt, noch Mitglied zu werden. Dann könnt ihr nämlich hinkommen und darüber mitentscheiden. Ich laufe ihr hier rum. Ihr könnt mich einfach jederzeit ansprechen, auch heute Abend irgendwie bei einem Bier. Twitter, Toini, E-Mail-Adresse. Und das war die letzte Folie. Danke, Christian. Für die, die nicht verstehen, es ist nur Allemand. Es geht um Geld. Uh, Jens uh, und, und dann uh, Sofia Kosovan, she around? Okay. Uh, Jens is going to speak about the big data cheat sheet. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fantastic. So welcome everybody. So I'm in data management. By, I've been in data management like for almost 20 years now. I basically work on scaling large data sets, how to access large data sets very quickly. And of course, I also do Python. Python is fantastic. That's why I'm here. But uh, my research is not so much about Python. Mainly it's about making database engines fast. So in many different contexts, I worked on that in many memory databases, column stores, Hadoop, NoSQL, blah, blah, blah. And the, the point I want to drive home here really is that with current technology, there is no database performance problem anymore. If you tell me they have a database performance problem, well, look at the manual or try to understand what you're doing. Because in particular, when you look at human perception speed, and that's like 25 milliseconds, whatever query you do in a database these days, it's like, yeah, it's super ultra fast if you do it right. Yeah, just to give you an idea, a transaction maybe some of you know from this very boring undergrad lecture where we treat ACID, the ACID properties and transactions bundling multiple queries into one transaction. We can currently run half a million transactions per second per thread in my memory. It's totally insane. No one has that, not even Amazon. Or another example is uh, hash tables are currently at like 50 million operations per second, one thread again. So it's all super fast. And if it's slow, of course, the root of the course is Python. Right. It can't be a database. It must be Python that's slow. I'm just kidding. Of course, it's just other scripting languages, not Python. Python is fantastic. Um, I want to get here. I want to get out of here alive, of course. So um, database performance is a soft problem, but thank God there's big data. Everyone talks about big data. And what the heck does that mean, right? I mean, how large is big anyway? I had this question just over lunch. Uh, when does it start to be big? Yeah, where's the boundary between gigabytes or terabytes or two exabytes? No one really knows. It's, it's really a stupid term. But, but it's kind of a, a life belt for everyone handling data, uh, for the database community or data science uh, community, everyone who um, 
calls himself or herself a data scientist these days. There's big data, and all of a sudden, we can think about clever algorithms, yeah? Currently, to handle like a gigabyte of data, you can do anything, it's gonna be like that, yeah? Only for bigger data sets, you need uh, smart algorithms, and thank God, with big data, there's a need for, for smart algorithms. But, um, yeah, and here comes a little bit the arrogant part. As a professor, I have to admit, well, big data is not so much a research problem, it's more of an education problem, actually, because when you look at the stuff, when you look at papers that are being published in the field, it's kind of always the same solutions you're seeing. Unfortunately, yeah, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know. Um, but actually, that, that made me just recently, uh, I gave a keynote at a big conference, and I made this wild claim, saying in front of database people, hey, it's all solved, let's go home, and was kind of mixed reactions anyway. But, but um, <laughs> so, um, I think it's only four techniques, and I just want to present them briefly. One is, and they're all super simple. Huh? One is horizontal partitioning. You, you chop it into multiple slices, um, and then you can scale indefinitely. The other is replication. Yeah, replicate it to another machine, to another layer of your storage layer. Call it caching or view materialization. It's all the same stuff. Yeah? That will help a lot. Hashing. Yeah, Google says the, most, the three most important techniques in computer science are hashing, hashing, and hashing. Yeah? You can do anything with that. Blockchain is just hashing. It's just a Merkley tree. Come on, it's just hashing. And the same holds for data management. Differential files, that's reinvented five times every year. If you don't know what that is, Google for it immediately. Please don't reinvent that. And, uh, but it's, it's a killer technique. And you may, you may notice all of these things are cross technology. I'm not saying, hey, use Spark, use Flink, use SAP, use whatever. I don't care. It's always the same techniques, really, believe me. And that made me design such a poster. Uh, so the, the bad news is the poster already exists in my office on two whiteboards. And it's a bit more, uh, like, it's not just only four techniques, it's actually 10 or 12. Um, but if you're interested in this stuff, a couple of weeks from now, it will be available for download at um, daemon.ai. That's a startup I'm currently kicking off in that area. So if you're interested, um, I mean, it, you still have to have some background knowledge. It's more like a cook, yeah? and this poster provides you with the um, ingredients. I mean, it's not just I tell you, hey, there's an oven, spark, and here's, here are the ingredients. Um, like the different data management techniques, you still have to s be very skillful in combining the ingredients to cook a delicious meal. It's not just putting them together as I do typically when I cook. Uh, so it's, it's not that easy, but I think it gives you some overview on the techniques that are out and hopefully helps you a little bit in uh, clarifying what you need to do to, to solve your big data um, project. And finally, last but not least, everyone is talking about data science, but I think we are really all data scientists in AI. That's so much sexier. That should be the new term. Thanks. Thank you, Jens. Uh, Sophia? And then the last one, Open Source Days Copenhagen. Okay. We will have probably time for one or two more lightning tools. Would someone like to give one? No, I'm not going to show my VMRC. Okay. You speak. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Unfortunately, I don't have slides. I asked um, if uh, the slides, if the lightning talk is without slides, right? And, but I guess, Okay, so there is no way back. Um, okay, I want to talk, I, I'm Sofia and I'm working as a data scientist and I, um, I want to, my, my topic is the, the things they don't tell you in, in university because I've been studying, studying university, I did my master, then I started working in industry and there are some things which I didn't expect will happen in industry when I um, was still in university. So I program in Python in the last two and a half years. All the challenges, I will tell seven things and they all happen to me or to my friends or to my colleagues. And I will tell about challenges which you have in industry, which you may not expect that will happen to you after university. So first thing, for example, I recently got two weeks ago a data table, and there was 1,000 instances, and I for machine learning, this is already something, 1,000 sounds good, but there was first column and there, was, there were IDs. And then they started with 17.4, 17.6, and then my, I called my experts, so I called the person who knows what does it mean, and he told me, oh, Sophia, you actually should not use, you should use only data which starts with, with ID 17.6. 
And 95% of data did not start with ID 17.6. It means I had to remove 95% of data, it means I'm left with 50 instances. That's the first thing which you should expect in industry that you may be left with really too little data, even if at the beginning it looks a lot. Second problem, uh, sometimes I get the table and then when I expect values like up from zero, so normal values like 10, 15, and 20 of some parameters, um, sometimes there are missing values, sometimes there are values like zero, sometimes there are minus, and sometimes there is minus thousand. As a data scientist, you have to decide, so second problem I want to mention, sometimes it's not like you just have missing values. Sometimes you have minus thousand or minus or zero, and you have to decide what do you do with this. Uh, third thing, um, for example, you get, you get a table, and then you have to do some regression or classification problem, and then you have 50 variables. And then expert is telling you, Sophia, it's very important, column number 50, you have to use this column for modeling. Without this, you don't do modeling. Column variable number 50 is the most important. Then you open the table, and the, then you get it from database, and the column number 50 is empty. There are no values. And then I call, I call my another friend, and I'm like, sorry, there is, there are no values. And they're like, oh, we didn't, we didn't log it. And then they start logging it, and okay, they're like, okay, now you have it, and then, but maybe there is one point per day. I have one instance per day, so I need to wait one more year because they just started logging it yesterday. Like, Sophia, but I just logged it. I, I'm like, thank you, but I need it to be logged for one year. I can't, the fourth thing in industry, you have to be ready that you don't have the data logged, and this is maybe the most important variable which you need for modeling, and you just don't have it because someone didn't click one checkpoint just to start logging this data from the sensor. The, another thing, so you have, for example, 3,000 images for classification, and your boss is like, okay, great, 3,000, sounds a lot. Of course, it's not one million, about which we are taught in university that you will have one million. MNIST data set, oh my God, digits, you have one million, where is this million came from? No one is telling us. But in industry, you have 3,000, it's great, you are lucky. But the problem is, I had this again one week ago. I have 2,955 images from one class, and I have five images of another class. Guess which class is very important to detect? And my boss is like, Sophia, you understand that this is really important to detect this class. It happens really rare. I'm like, yeah, I noticed it happens rare. <laughs> I, have, I have five images. What do you want from me? And then you start. Yeah, OK, that's another problem. So, um, <laughs> and. <laughs> Another, another problem I was working with, for example, anomaly detection. So you have rotating element, and then you have to detect anomaly. And then, in order to detect anomaly, what do you need? Anomaly data. To get anomaly data, what do you need? You need to produce anomaly. To produce anomaly means, literally, break something on the machine. And then you tell your colleagues, okay, so can we break something on your machine, and then we will be able to give you a model which will predict you, maybe three days in advance, that some element is wrong, and they are telling you, no, you can't. You can't, you can't break anything on our machine. So how to do anomaly detection if you don't have anomaly data because you're not allowed to break anything? Because who would like that you're breaking something? All these problems happen in industry. And when we learn things in university about anomaly detection, condition monitoring, where is this data coming from? Who will run now for you the machine until it will be destroyed? Who? Like, it's really, in industry, it's a little bit more difficult. Another problem, sometimes your boss is telling you, uh, so you have to build a classification model. You have six images. This happened actually to my friend. He had six images and they wanted him to build a machine learning model. And he's like, this is not possible. And boss is like, I don't care, it's not possible. I sold it to customer, it costs few million. <laughs> I, I already talked few million dollars, like what do you mean not possible? You built a model, you have to build a model. And then you tell him, overfitting is possible. You know, if you have six images and you have like tons of features, you can overfit. He doesn't know what is overfit. Yeah, okay. And the last thing I want to tell you, which happens to my friend, so all examples are real, okay? This is nothing which I just invented. And one thing which happened to my friend, so he was doing a camera, like image recognition, video recognition. There was a plant, and plant was growing. So there was some leaves and stuff, right? They were detecting how fast is the plant growing and so on. And then they called, customer called, and like, listen, your method is not working. For some reason, we don't see if the plant is growing or not. Then he traveled there, maybe it was even another country, then he came. So what they did, some people, they put books, the, the, these books, they closed the view of the camera on this plant. So, <laughs> I mean, again, so there was a plant and there was a camera, camera recognition, like there was images, there was videos recorded, and it stopped working because someone just put books in between. So it's not a problem that the method machine learning is not working. Maybe you just remove the books or... I mean, sometimes there are just things which just blow your mind. I think it's really interesting, that's why I work in industry. 
Um, but, <laughs> but what I want to say, my main thing is that I think some things should be told in university also. And when we talk about perfect data set with no missing labels, no missing values, everything is great, we have million data set, butterflies, you have to be ready when you go to industry that you can get this kind of problems which I had like in the last two years. So, and my friends, uh, yeah. Thank you for the attention. <laughs> I, had to, I have to admit, uh, it was an anomaly that happens only once a year, but I forgot to start the timer at the beginning. <laughs> uh, the last uh, short, it will be only two minutes, Open Source Days Copenhagen. Also mein Laptop tut so, als würde funktionieren. Entschuldigung. <lacht> ah, okay. Schon. Yeah, um, okay, uh, then I, it's, it's actually quite possible without. Um, so I want to introduce a, a, an open source conference that is going to be, oh, I don't know the date, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that is going to be in Copenhagen in uh, May next year, I think. No, in March, the 16th and 17th of March. And uh, the, the 16th is going to be the business day that I don't care so much about. But if you have something you want to sell to people, by all means, uh, sign up as a speaker. Our, both our call for speakers and our call for sponsors is open. And anything open source goes. Uh, for the business day, it's not even there a bit more loose about their definition of open source. But for the community day, we really like full on force, whatever it might be. Um, we had last year, we had, uh, for instance, as a keynote, uh, something from the Open Hardware Association. And um, yeah, pretty much pre we had Tails OS and then all kinds of stuff, dev tools. Um, so yes, it's in Copenhagen, 16th, 17th of March. Call for sponsors, call for speakers. And it would be really nice to see some more international people. We had some from all around, but it would be good to get even more international audience in. Thank you. So, Dele, das war für heute. That's all for today. Uh, we have a data science meetup uh, by Innovex who has uh, signed up uh, tomorrow, the same place, uh, same room, same uh, time. You uh, the lightning talks, you can sign up uh, uh, next uh, to the conference desk. Uh, I think Alexander wants to tell a few warm words for the end of the day. Yeah, how did you enjoy the first day of PyCon? Yeah, thank you very much. So tomorrow uh, we'll be back uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, we, have this, we have the social event tomorrow. You don't forget to pick up your, we will have laces. Uh, um, uh, you have to pick them up. Uh, just go there, tell us your name at the registration disk and pick up and get ready for the social event. And um, yeah, see you back tomorrow and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.